recently I wanted to get into, it's called Naturkunde, yeah? We would call it the Natural History Museum in Berlin. You know, I wanted to visit. Um, but my museum season ticket, uh, 50 euros, don't get the 35 one. The 50 is brilliant, yeah? Um, doesn't include the uh, Naturkunde, you can't get in there. But we have Museum Sunday. Have you heard of Museum Sunday in Berlin? That on the first Sunday of every month, all the museums, about 70 of them, are free. That's the first Sunday, but you have to book, yeah? And uh, some of them are hard to get into, so you, you have to book, you can only book seven days in advance. So a load of us are sitting there Saturday night, a quarter to 12, <laughs> waiting for the bookings to open to get into the, the Pergamon or whatever, you know. But others you can book the next day. But it's fantastic. Anyway, it was easy to get into the Naturkunde. I'll use the German word, the natural history one. And um, yeah, I went with my girlfriend. Uh, it was great. I loved it. I really loved it. It was packed. Packed with young children. Yeah? Happy children. Uh, children, I heard children singing naturally. You know, not led in song, just singing, you know, privately. Um, why? It's the home of the dinosaurs. Yeah? And uh, my goodness me. And the people arrived and we saw them coming in. Um, and we, you know, we got our two tickets, we booked them, but people were coming in five across, you know, this, it was like a, a, a Spanish uh, Catholic procession, you know, all these people coming in and the attendants sort of gave up and we said, you're not checking the tickets. They said, no, the boss has said, just let them in, which is so un-German, I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's brilliant. Break the rules, you know. Never meet that, you know. And they pour, and the place was packed. Yeah, it was really packed, and it was happy. I mean, and there, you know, um, you, you you see the twelve meter long Tyrannosaurus Rex. My goodness, me, twelve meters long, even bigger. The great uh, was it Triceratops, this plant eating monster, and. Um, Children love dinosaurs. I think uh, wherever there is a supermarket in the world, there will be dinosaurs, you know, on cereal packets or little plastic toys. China make manufacturing millions of plastic dinosaurs and then flooding the planet, you know. And I, I read an article by a journalist. You see, it does relate to evolution a bit, yeah? I read an article by a journalist who asked himself this question, why do children love dinosaurs? He then sort of explored it, you know, that they, they don't carry any baggage, you know, like uh, Barbie or Ken or whatever, you know, we'll come back to them later. Um, but uh, he said he watched his son put in a military rows 80 of his dinosaurs, all in rows, yeah? And uh, he said he knew the name and the habits of every single one of them, this young son. <laughs> You're nodding. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, so uh, yeah, children love them. And so dinosaurs are really part of our culture now, yeah? Um, with a few exceptions, some American states and uh, a few Islamic countries, you know, apart from these, uh, evolution is generally accepted. And it's, it's almost a myth. It's, you know, it's, it's part of our culture, yeah? So, all right. So today, uh, I'm going, it's going to be a very amateur uh, overview of evolution. I hope not too amateurish. And I also want to talk about Carl Jaspers and his theory of the axial age, all right? And later on, I'll just talk about a later phase in evolution, which my teacher called the higher evolution. So I'll say a few words about that later on. All right, so we look at history. If we look at it from a biologist's point of view, we see plant, well, we see plants rising, um, insects on the planet, uh, the fish give rise to vertebrates, blah, 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 blah. A sociologist would see uh, groups forming, then uh, villages, towns, cities, you know, wars, whatever. Um, but today, I really would try, like to try and look at it in terms of not sociology or biology, but consciousness. Like, you know, consciousness arriving on the planet. Okay. So, quick history. Four and a half billion years ago, 
a dense cloud of dust, solidified, and we got our solar system. Fantastic, all right. Uh, 3.7 billion years ago, microscopic organisms uh, appeared because we found fossils for them, yeah? Um, fungi appeared about a billion years ago. And then uh, later then after that, plants and insects, about 400 million years ago, all right, 400 million years ago. That's the age of the shark, by the way, I found out. Yeah, curious, isn't it? I also discovered that trees are only 380 million years. So sharks are older than trees. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> I heard it on a, a radio quiz and I looked it up and it's true. Yeah. So there we go. But 400 million years ago, um, yeah, some of the fish started developing real limbs and lungs and necks that could swivel. Yeah. And so they started exploring the land and then the land invasion by the uh, vertebrates began. A vertebrate is a creature with a backbone. Before that, what was it? Jellyfish, insect, insects with an exoskeleton, but the vertebrates were not yet here. And then these fish came on land and uh, it was the invasion of the vertebrates. From these came reptiles, dinosaurs, mammals, evolution. Okay. Back to Naturkunde, you go into this museum and you can see all the heads of all the different hominids. It's fantastic, yeah? In all models, some skulls, yeah? But uh, there were loads of attempts by nature to produce us, yeah? Uh, they nearly all failed. I think, uh, who is it? Uh, Neanderthal, yeah. That seems to have survived. We have Neanderthal in us today. Yeah, but all the rest seem to disappear. Okay. And, and it says on the labels that many of them didn't have the structure to speak. They couldn't use language. The bones are not there. Yeah. Um, they could bark and scream and all the rest. And I'm sure communicate very well indeed, but not speak. And some other BBC program I listened to, it turns out that in order to learn to develop speaking, it was very expensive for us. Yeah. We had to change our bodies so much that we are now in great danger of choking. It's expensive speaking and it takes a lot of brain power too. All right. So. These hominids, they did communicate. And now I want to talk about the crows. And uh, yes, uh, I, I, I stayed in Ireland for three years. I worked about 12 hours a week teaching English. And I had all these hours to sit in the garden. There were fields in front, fields behind. I was on my own. And I used to watch the crows. I watched the cows, watch the sheep. But the crows were amazing. A rough lot. A rough lot. You know, I can't say they were nice people, yeah? But... Uh, some magpie, you know, the black and white ones, yeah, Elster in Deutsch, yeah, they, they, they find some food. They're good at finding it. And once they found it, the crows, they're all down, beat up the magpie. They hate magpies, yeah? And they're all sort of arguing over this bit of food. And then down comes the head honcho, the big crow, and he just beats everybody up. <laughs> then he goes for the food, yeah? So it was amazing watching this society, yeah? Um, I got to know them very well. Sometimes, once I saw this beautiful diamond in the sky of four birds, and it was a buzzard, you know, looking for bird's nests and things, and three crows were escorting it, just like some Russian spy plane being escorted <laughs> past Europe, you know. It was, it was perfect, all in silence, yeah? Um, I've seen something similar in Berlin over Temple Hofer Felt, but uh, there there was this horrible gargling from this crow as it beat the hell out of some other bird, it, up, high up in the air. All right. Um, so Easter time, they cro I'm calling them crows. They're really rooks, but the Irish call them all crows. Uh, they rejoice. They, they do acrobats. The noise is deafening. Um, and uh, it, they, I think they're generally showing off. It's amazing, flying as high as they can, straight down, wham, it's brilliant, yeah? And it's very loud. Um, then, uh, what's... There's the nest building, the nest building, and uh, the males, I'm jumping ahead here, the males, they have to collect wood, you know, very green wood. Um, and sometimes the wood's too heavy and it drops on my house, yeah? And I collect it, it's firewood, it's great, lovely. But um, they come home with these very green bits of wood and the female builds the nest. Well, communication. I watch this male 
Uh, crows can complain, and this male was sitting there, he'd done enough, but he's sitting on his branch. And this female's above him, and she's just going, Wah! He's not moving. Wah! And she keeps it up. Wah! And he's like, mm. And eventually, she just jumped and dropped, and with both feet, landed on his head, and sprung off his head like a diving board at the pool. <laughs> and off he went. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a community. It's an absolute community. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember um, in, yes, in, in winter they have a grand meeting. They have a huge meeting. And for an hour, hour and a half, they fly in from all directions of, of the compass. And they, they accumulate in all the trees around this field. There may be 10,000 of them. It takes about an hour and a half. And they all gather, all, and then suddenly somebody says something, and they all take off and fly off over the lake together. I don't know what that is. Show of power, <laughs> who knows what. Right? But, you know, yeah. And then in the dead of winter, it's quiet. It's quiet. It's absolutely quiet. And it's lovely. It's very quiet. Uh, there's no wind. And then suddenly you hear this. Bark. You think, what was that? There's no business going on. There's nothing to do. There's no. And then from about two kilometers away, you hear. Bark. And they're texting, you know. <laughs> yeah. You OK? I'm all right. Oh, good. Glad everything's okay. And it, it really is, it really is communication. Yeah? So there we go. Um, so, that, so I'm just coming back to our poor old hominids. That they, would, they would have communicated similarly, yeah? And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But when I was a kid, uh, not so much a kid, a bit older than that, 18, going to college, this book came out by this fellow, Danakin. Uh, Erich von Danekin, you're nodding, you know it. It was rubbish, <laughs> utter rubbish. The scientists slammed it, all the scientists slammed it. And actually he, did a, he, he got three years for fraud, he was not a great guy. But um, his book was, Was God an Astronaut? And so all these students are up in the middle of the night, Was God an Astronaut? Did he come down? And then uh, amazingly, um, there was a film uh, the Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, 2001. Just, has anybody seen 2001? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad. Uh, it was a great, the, the camera work is a little dated. It's very slow. You know, films were slow in those days. And uh, it came out in 1968. And some of our teachers, they said, you know, we want an easy afternoon. So six buses were hired and... Two years, 200 schoolboys, all in smart little uniforms. We all went up to Soho to watch 2001. Great. And it was in Cinerama. So the screen went around the audience with three 35mm projectors synchronised. It was good. It was really, really good. You, know, <laughs> you were in the desert, you know, with all these hominids screaming and fighting. And then basically what happens is one morning there's this obelisk standing there, like a huge tombstone, and the, the, these hominids touch it and somehow consciousness begins. Yeah? And then the theme of the, the whole movie is that uh, tens of thousands of years later, in 2001, they find another one on the moon and uh, the spacemen touch it and wham! It's the next stage in the development of uh, humankind, yes? So this is like, is, was God an astronaut in a film? You know, it's the same sort of thing. By the way, if you, if, <laughs> I'm sure there's more people have been to see Barbie, yes? And that weird scene at the beginning with all these little girls smashing their dolls on the ground and suddenly there's these Barbie legs there in the middle. It's a perfect parody of Stanley Kubrick's 2001. It's exactly the same. They picked, they, you know, like, it was a homage, we call it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's it. Barbie's not going to get mentioned again, you'll be pleased to know. Good. I've been threatened. Yeah. <laughs> so, great. <laughs> right. But, they, but I thought, is it so absurd that God is an astronaut? <gasps> What's Lundus Rattler going to say? Um, 
it is absurd that consciousness could be imparted in 10 minutes. That's ridiculous. But uh, Jan's not here. But I remember uh, she came home one day with her husband and two tiny kittens had followed her from the, from the forest. These homeless little kittens followed her. So they let them in the car. They brought them home. They're now two very big, handsome cats. They're big, you know, and they live with them. And Jan, she said, she said um, yeah, they've become human. <laughs> you know, they were really wild. Now they're sort of human, lays around, know what they're doing, look beautiful, elegant, you know, cats do, yeah? And uh, so, so it's like pets can sort of imbibe something from humans. There is, you know, it's possible. It is possible. And then I thought, is it possible? And then I thought, hang on. When the Buddha got enlightened two and a half thousand years ago, loads of his followers got enlightened too. Well, that's the same principle. You know, they're being influenced by living with a living Buddha. And the Buddha himself, he said, he said, he was like the first chick that was born, you know. All the eggs are there and a chick hatches and it goes around tapping on all the other eggs, going, oi, wake up, you know, it's time, you know. And the Buddha said he was the first chick. So there we go. So mm, consciousness does overlap. And hang on, the meditation class is here on a Saturday. We do influence each other. We really do. It's so helpful. When you get a few good meditators in the room, it's like lifting us all up. It's great. Yeah. So, all right. Yes, animals domesticating dogs. They've been around 30,000 years. And you can really love a dog, can't you? You can love a dog if you're a dog person. Yeah. And I remember an old Christian saying to me when I was young, uh, he believed in... Uh, reincarnation. We don't use that word, we say rebirth. He said, uh, he believed in reincarnation. I said, how? You're a Christian, you know. Who was it? Uh, Emperor Constantine. He made it anathema in the fourth century. If you believe in rebirth, you get burnt to death. You know, that's the Catholic teaching, yeah. So, and here's this Christian uh, believing in rebirth. And I said, how'd you get there? He said, and he had this little Jack Russell on his lap. And he said, You know, we're the same. He didn't say anything, he just... And the dog adores him, and he adores the dog. And okay, the dog, it can't do Sudoku, it can't tune the radio, but emotionally, it's there, you know, it's there. It probably knows better what's going on emotionally than anybody else, you know? So there we go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I do feel like Dr. Doolittle sometimes. I was telling Simon the other day about meeting this lonely donkey. It was just screaming at me. It was going, nah, 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 nah. and the loneliness in my heart killed me. So I just stayed with the donkey for a while and it calmed down, you know. And then there was a, a building site in Essen, Germany, and these two huge Rottweilers were protecting it. And they saw me and they <laughs> And I said, oh, you lovely boys, you lovely, lovely boys. The two dogs went, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and within minutes, I had my fingers through the wire and they're licking my fingers, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, there's this relationship. Okay, good. So, we have all these hominids. There's one hominid, I love his name, Homo hab habilis, yeah. And he is the first one to make tools, yeah? Uh, say she as well. Um, and uh, I just like his name. It can mean um, able man, but it can also mean handyman. <laughs> and anybody from Great Britain, or the Brits all laugh, because we have got loads of handyman jokes, you know, but we move on. So his name was Handyman, and he could make tools out of bone or stone, good. So that's him. He, la he died out about one and a half million years ago. Um, yeah, then cave paintings appear with figures in them about 40,000 years ago. We're, we're, we're arriving, we're arriving. Uh, 12,000 years ago, the first significant farms. Um, uh, and then with a surplus of crops, cities could then exist. You needed a lot of extra food for a city to exist. And that happened. So the cities come into being uh, about 6,000 years ago. And, um, and all of this is virtually automatic, yeah? This is what Sanger actually calls the lower evolution. It happens. You only have to get born and you end up with language, culture, you know? 
relative safety, great. It's automatic, all right? And consciousness is really arriving, yeah? And um, we, uh, we end up with uh, even reflexive consciousness. Ooh. Consciousness that can be aware of itself. So I'm now just going to nip into this uh, little mitratar, and I'm just going to read. It's about a page of it, so make yourselves comfortable. I'm just going to read. Um, and it's Sangharachita writing about Karl Jaspers. Okay, so I'll just read. Time? Okay, good. The 600-year period from around 800 BC to 200 BC was a decisive turning point in human history. All over the civilized world in those years, man, the human race, that is, took a great step forward. Karl Jaspers has called this period the Axial Age, because as he saw it, and in this insight many are agreed with him, it is upon this point, this period, that the whole of human history turns as if on an axis. Looking at the, at the ancient Greece of those days, we see that it was the period of Socrates and Plato, as well as uh, a whole galaxy of other thinkers. It was the period of great dramatic poets like Aeschylus and Sophocles, and of great non-dramatic poets like Pindar. In fact, this period in the history of Greece constitutes one of the great glories of human achievement, of human civilization and culture. Turning to Israel, what do we see? We see that the Axial Age was the period of some of the greatest of the prophets. It was during this age that the second Isaiah spoke out. It was the period of Jeremiah and of Amos and an, a number of other great Hebrew poets, some of whose insights echo down the corridors of Western world even today. And amazingly, Amos is quoted by Martin Luther King in his I Had a Dream. Some of Amos's words are in his uh, speech, yeah? So, it, it, you know, his words are with us today. And Amos and Jeremiah were really interested in dragging sort of the Israelites back to ethics. And, uh, and Amos talks about friendliness and things like this. This is 500 years before Christ, you know? Good. Um, in Persia, this was the period of Zoroaster or Zarathustra, or of the last of the Zarathustras, the founder of the new Zarathustrian religion, the religion of the conflict between light and darkness. You know, many sort of dualistic religions came later. Um, going even further afield to China, we find that this was the period of the two greatest figures, um, perhaps in the whole history of Chinese thought, especially moral thought, Lao Tzu and Confucius. You know, Confucius bringing in all these ethics about the family and uh, filial duty and law and order. And Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu, when I, when I was in my teens, every hippie toilet seemed to have a book of the Tao Te Ching in it. Yeah? <laughs> Some people are nodding. It was a beautiful book, printed in black and white, the sayings of uh, Lao Tzu. It was lovely. It really was, you know? So, I don't know why we all read it in the toilet, but there we go. So, all right. Maybe we had the time. Um, and of course, turning to India, we find that the Axial Age was the period of the Upanishadic sages. Above all, it was the period of Gotama the Buddha, as well as the period of Mahavira, the founder of Jainism. So looking about the world during the Axial Age, we see that all these more civilized areas, Greece, Israel, Persia, India, China, were bursting with spiritual life and activity. They produced all sorts of great people, great creative figures, all of whom have one thing in common, whether belonging to Greece or India or Israel or Persia or China, they all stand out very clearly. They have recognisable individuality. They are all recognisable individuals. They stand out clear and distinct. We can recognise them even across Gulf, the gulf of centuries, can know them, enter into a sort of personal relationship with them. 
But when one says that they are all individuals with a capital I, one does, does not mean that they are individualists. An individualist, this is Sangharachana's definition, is just a person with a particularly strong ego that perhaps is rather fond of inflicting on other people. An individual is something different. A real individual, a true individual, whether a spiritual individual or a creative individual or a thinking individual, is one who has developed in some way or another, through one discipline or another, to one degree or another, self-awareness or self-consciousness. Great. Oh, by the way, I just found that Confucian. He said, do not do unto others what you would not want done to yourself. Yeah? Christ says that 500 years later. It's called the golden rule. Yeah? Do as you would be done by. Yeah? So there we go. That was his contribution. All right. Being self-aware. The Russian writer Vladimir Nabokov describes it as so. And Nabokov, you have to read him. He was Russian. I can't remember if he went to Oxford or Cambridge. He was Russian. His English is beautiful. I read Lolita, yeah? It's beautiful. It's like poetry. The whole book, it, the lines, they spring, they dance. It's, it's such writing, you know? He got a bit of racism at university, but he said, I'm only speaking in my second language. You should hear me in Russian, you know? So there we go. But his statement about uh, self-awareness, he called it being aware of being aware of being. This, these are his words. And he goes on to say, in other words, if I not only know that I am, but also know that I know it, then I belong to the human species. All the rest follows, the glory of thought, poetry, a vision of the universe. So those are his words. Let's just look at his sentence. There is being. There is being. That's the first thing. Pick an animal. Please, Amy, pick an animal. A cat. All right. So the cat, it's, oh, it's got being, hasn't it? You can feel it. You can sense it. You can smell it. You know, it exists, right? It's got being. Great stuff. All right? The next sentence. Then being aware of being. The cat, it's a bit ambiguous because cats are so proud, you know. I saw our cat once run down the garden and trip over and he just went, no, it did not happen. <laughs> I just saw it, you know. Coolest creature on the planet, you know, yeah. So I'm not too sure about the cat, you know. But <laughs> should have picked a snake. But <laughs> no, there. But, uh, but being aware of being, that's the ordinary person, yeah. They know that their life is worth something to them, yeah. They may say my life is worth more than his or her life, you know. That's being aware of being. Then someone who sees this awareness of oneself might just stop to wonder, uh, to ponder this awareness of themselves. They just wonder at it, yeah. They say, I am not just aware of things, I am aware of myself as a separate object to all the other objects, and also, I am amazed by this awareness of my own awareness. <laughs> yeah. When you really get a quiet spot, and go, <laughs> <sighs> it's astonishing, <laughs> absolutely astonishing, yeah? And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is what Nobokov says is the human characteristic that separates us from the animals and a lot of other humans too. Sorry to sound so uh, whatever, you know, but uh, <laughs> some, anyway, it's not everybody who's aware of being aware of being, yeah, right. So, you know, the animal world, the dog might be aware of a rabbit, yeah. And I used to, I used to, in Ireland, I used to visit the dog lady up the road, uh, Mrs. Baker. She had 66 dogs. Uh, people, if they had a dog and they want to get rid of it, they take it to Mrs. Baker's and throw it over the wall, you know, <laughs> honestly, or just tie it to the fence post. And she kept them all. And she'd go around doing... F she lived in destitution. She lived in a caravan with no door. I saw the snow go into the house, you know. And she'd make you a cup of tea. And um, God help us. I don't know how I did it. But the, the cup of tea, 
She said, do you want a clean cup or a, a dirty one? I'm clean if I can. And she'd wipe it a bit. But it had about two or three centimetres of solid brown sugar from all the years of sweet tea lying at the bottom of it. It was solid. It, the, the, the sugar had become part of the cup, you know. And it used to pick the dog hairs off. And uh, she'd offer me some cheese. No, 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 it's all right. The tea will do. It was at 100 degrees. That's great enough for me. But, um, but she'd have... These, and 10 of the dogs were allowed to sleep on her bed. I, I said, how do they, how'd you organise? She goes, they organise that, you know. <laughs> but I watched this dog dreaming. This dog, little dog's full of, as fast asleep. And he goes, <laughs> and he's chasing rabbits. He's dreaming about chasing rabbits, you know. This is consciousness, yeah? It really is, you know. Uh, but he's not aware of himself chasing rabbits. That's the difference. He just goes... Yeah, in, in his or her head is going, rabbit. You know, it goes left, I go left, it goes right, I go right. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, the cat, when it sees a bird, it's just, there's a cat. There's a bird in the universe. So that's, that's it, yeah. Um, but as I said, you have to be a little bit careful because I love, oh, Winston Churchill, <laughs> he came out with a few things. And one of them was, I love this, he said, when you look a pig in the eye, more than a pig looks back at you. That's spooky, yeah? Because they're so near to us, you know, uh, biologically, yeah? And uh, they're looking back at you going, hmm, all right. Okay. <laughs> so, and yes, there have been gorillas that have been taught sign languages. They show embarrassment if you catch them playing with their dolls and things like that. So, yeah, 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 all right, good. But Sangharakshita, yeah, um, he writes about the arising of the individual and he calls this the true individual and he gives it qualities. And this list of qualities has got longer and longer over the years. I couldn't remember that many of them. But the true individual, as he calls them, is independent of mind. They think for themselves. Yeah, They don't just go on the opinions of the local papers or the opinions of their parents. They think for themselves. Yeah, um, They have courage. They're willing to be courageous. Yeah. And you saw that with Socrates. Socrates, he has been condemned by the courts of Athens to death for corrupting the youth of Athens. What he's done, he's taught them how to think. And the group doesn't like an individual. It doesn't like true individuals. So kill him. Kill him. And it's lovely. I do, if you ever, please, uh, there's a book, The Last Days of Socrates. It is so readable, it could have been written last week. Yeah, it's a good read. It's not a big book. I love, I couldn't believe it. And he's, he's just, all his disciples say, look, we've got horses. Everybody wants you to escape. Even the courts want you to escape. Yeah, because they often, you know, in, in, I'm sorry, I'm remembering this now. Uh, when you're condemned, you can come up with an alternative uh, sentence. Yeah. So they say you're condemned to death and they're all hoping he'll say, uh, could you banish me instead? And they go, yes. But his alternative uh, punishment is um, a pension for life and freedom of the city. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? So he has to die, all right? And uh, he's there with his friends and, uh, okay, it sounds a bit sexist, but these young men are all weeping. And he said, I got rid of the women because they all weep. And look at you lot, you know? You're all you're <laughs> doing the same, you know? But they're trying to persuade him. We've got horses. We've got friends in other countries. He said, no. I fought, and he was a very courageous fighter. I fought on the battlefields for the lords of Athens. They have condemned me to death. I go. Very simple. Then he goes through all these proofs that there is another life. He says, you see the ghosts hanging around at cemeteries, you know. And he goes through all these different proofs, you know. And then uh, in comes the executioner, gives him the hemlock, feels his legs, and off he goes. He dies. It's a lovely death. <laughs> <laughs> there are some great deaths in history. This is one of the good ones, you know. It's, it's yeah, so good on him. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, courageous, loyal, energetic, able to forgive, you know. Um, positive emotion, they're rooted in positive emotions, yeah. Generous, so all these qualities of the true individual. He also writes about the group. Oh, the group. The groups have been with us for a long, long time. Those hominids were in groups, you know. Um, the group can be very helpful. As I said, we end up with language, basic culture, protection. Great, yeah? Safety, it's lovely, yeah? 
Uh, most of our lives are lived in groups. It could be political parties, clubs, uh, religions, races. Yeah, group, 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 group. However, the group has expectations of you. Yeah? You have to follow the laws. That's fair enough. Okay, I'll go along with that one. Maybe you have to go to war and die for the group. So there's a price. Yeah? And uh, what I seem to have noticed is that the spiritual community... Oh, no, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> I ran ahead, sorry. But um, the group is not too bothered about the individual. It wants to preserve itself. Okay. So here we have our... Uh, now I'm getting into it. I ran ahead too quickly there. The, these individuals or nascent individuals, they're, 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 their consciousness is developed. They're reflexive. They're, and it's a bit hard for them. You know, uh, I don't really like society that much. I feel a bit odd and this, that and the other. And spiritual communities can form. And they protect other nascent, other budding, true individuals. They create a safe place for them, yeah, for them to develop, yeah. Um, I went online the other day to look for recommendations for good learning when you're teaching in institutions, just the conditions for uh, productive learning. Yeah, I found about 40 different sites. I didn't go into them all, but some had three points, some four, some five, some eight points. You know, you need this, that and the other. None of them, none of them said provide a safe environment. None of them. And I had this idea in my head because of a, a, a dear friend of mine, uh, uh, Andrew Knight, years ago, he had this other list and his list started off, you provide a safe environment for the student. And if the student makes mistakes, it's fine. They're free to fail. Wow. This is where I'd like to be. You know, then all the other conditions came in. Yeah? So this hopefully is what the spiritual community has these qualities. You can really get it wrong, but you will be encouraged. You'll be supported. Um, Blah, 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 blah. Good. Uh, there's a young fella called Megia. Uh, he's a companion of the Buddha. And he makes a mess of it. He really does. He says, oh, I want to get... He says, all right, for you, you're enlightened. I want to go off and get enlightened. And he goes off to this, uh, what is it, a mango grove. And he meditates there. And it's a nightmare. All the muck that's in him comes up, demons, ill will, greed. It's a nightmare. And he comes back to the Buddha, mm, didn't work. <laughs> and the Buddha's great. And he just tells him what would work, yeah? And uh, I've got the last, it's a good old text, but I'm just going to give you the last bit. And he's describing the spiritual community. He says, you know, I've used the word monk. When a monk has admirable people as friends and companions... It's expected that you'll become virtuous, you know, that you'll uh, dwell sort of restrained in your habits, yet perfect in behaviour. You know, we'd, we'd expect you to do that if you've got really good company, yeah? You see the danger in getting things wrong. You know, you're careful. He says, when a monk has admirable friends, admirable people as friends, yeah, uh, he will get to hear at will, easily and without difficulty, talk. That is truly calming and conducive to the opening of awareness. Talk on modesty. So all the old, these older monks, their, their, their natural conversation is about good things that are beneficial, yeah? Um, when a monk has admirable uh, people as friends and companions, uh, he will be able to maintain his energy because you can sort of give up a bit on the spiritual path. You know, you meditate, 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 meditate. <laughs> And when you've got friends, they're like, come on, it's not so bad. Come to the Saturday class. There's lots of energy there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is what the spiritual community can do. It can encourage you. Yeah. And um, he says, uh, when a monk has admirable friend, people as friends, um, he will be perceptive. He will see the arising and falling of phenomena. This is profound. This is profound. This is the big insight. You see all the things that come into being and them all going out again. Yeah. You get besotted with a boyfriend or girlfriend, they get old. <laughs> they get bad-tempered. 
you know, hang loose a bit, you know. Uh, so everything rises and falls, yeah. And, uh, and he says, and this will lead to the end of stress, seeing this. He then gives him a few meditations, one to destroy craving, one to destroy conceit. And then, I love this, and this is two and a half thousand years ago, you should develop good will so as to abandon ill will. That's the practice we did last week, Metabhavna. You did that last week, yeah? Yeah. Um, and he said, you should develop mindfulness of the in and out breathing so as to cut off thinking. Now, sometimes a teaching jumps out at you, yeah? I've read this text loads of times. And doing this talk, I read this line and went, what? It jumped out at me. It so as to cut off thinking. I went, what? You know, it's like I've never read it before until uh, this week, yeah? And I've, I've had this plan. I've been doing the Metabarbara as a practice every day for about six months. And now I put my good friend in. Maybe well, maybe happy. Uh, then I'm shopping, and then the app does the bell. I go, oh yeah, yeah, it's my friend. Yeah, I've lost it, you know. And then I do the next stage, and I got them at the beginning. Then I've lost it, and then the bell goes, oh yeah, so and so. And I'm thinking, I can't get rid of all this crap thinking, yeah. And it says it here: mindfulness of breathing. It doesn't say it gets rid of the crap thinking, but it's it will. It's called pabansha. All this habitual nonsense. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it stops that. So he gives him these practices and another one to reflect on impermanence. Uh, yeah, if you meditate on impermanence, you will see uh, that there is no real self, not as you thought there was. There's no fixed self. And with that, he is released in the here and now. So, almost there. And I came along in 1977 to, I used to visit this community and all the guys were older. Uh, some of them had grown up in World War II. Their humour, it was not my humour, it was so funny, yeah? I was hearing jokes I've never heard before, you know? They were kind, you know? They, they, I just used to come in and visit. They saw my earnestness, calm down a bit, calm down, you know? Uh, once I visited their community and cooked a meal with chilli peppers, I misread the instructions. I put in tablespoons of chilli instead of teaspoons. <laughs> I must have burnt the mouths off them, but they were all very kind and polite and said they liked the meal. Uh, yeah. I remember travelling on retreat in the same year in the back of the car and uh, this order member, um, he fell asleep. Yeah. Later I discovered he was just pretending to sleep because I wouldn't stop asking questions. Yeah. So he's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is my contact with the spiritual community. Yeah. And it's lovely. And then years later, these, these four big characters who I first met, they were all so different. And I used to be amazed because I used to look at the class. And we had big classes then. You know, this is back in 77. So you have about 50, 60 people. And we all felt like sheep, yeah? And these four individuals, they were so different in personality. That really struck me. They meditate. They're finding themselves, you know. Okay, it's not a fair situation. You do lose your personality in an audience yeah but um but later on years later they appeared as archetypal figures in meditation and dreams yeah so community almost there today in this room now we are a community we only meet on saturdays but we are a community of sorts you see what i'm saying yeah it doesn't have to be black and white, yeah? There's degrees of community. There are people in this room who live in men's communities, yeah? Artikato, you're with four other guys? Yeah, great. Uh, you've got have visitors. Oh, six now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's some people who join study groups. Those are communities, yeah? So, um, and communities are, they're spiritual communities. A community can help calm you, you know? We don't have to justify our views again and again, you know, like with old friends or family, yeah? Um, hopefully we have insights uh, into ourselves, into life itself. We see the appallingly repetitive nature of the world, yeah? I was in an art gallery in Essen and they had, Essen, Germany, and the, in a framed picture was a newspaper from Britain from 1940, I think. It was the same news as today. Floods in East Anglia, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was the same news. 
you know, 70 years, 80 years later, it was the same news. But anyway, the repetitive nature of our whole existence, our greeds, our aversions, you know, they go on and on. And as we begin to see this, we let go and we start enjoying freedoms. And eventually, if we go all the way, an infinite freedom arises. The transcendental, whatever that is, is experienced. <laughs> Yeah, we don't know what it is. Yeah, the transcendental, where your your neighbour's uh, life is valuable to you. You know, his or her needs are your needs. Yeah, you've transcended your own small world. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. The lower evolution gave us all these wonderful things, language, culture, and all the rest. But the second part, the higher evolution. Here's the big one: the higher evolution is optional. You have to choose to do it. It's not automatic. Nobody can do it for you. Yeah? Some of those Hindu gurus say, yeah, crap. Sorry. <laughs> you have to do it. And uh, fortunately, and this is the last line of the, the talk, fortunately, there are companions along the way to help and encourage us. And this is the spiritual community. That's it.